Hi, we'd like to welcome with us today uh, Claire Nicholson, from, who is an occupational therapist from National Hospital in London, the neuro, say National Hospital Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. Make sure I get that right. Um, we're so yeah. excited to have you with us. This is the first time we've had somebody from OT here with us. So thank you so much for your, your time. Um, My pleasure, Bridget. So it, it, one of the questions we would like to ask you, currently are writing a paper on occupational therapy and the consensus recommendations for FND uh, in collaboration with other OTs. Uh, can you explain why that's important and a little bit about what you envision? Um, in yeah, so it's in, it's in collaboration with other OTs um, in the UK and in the US, um, but it's also in collaboration with um, other MDT um, members, um, so neurologists and neuropsychiatrists, uh, physiotherapists, and also we have um, Dawn from FND Hope um, involved in the process as well. Um, and the reason why that's come about, you probably be aware that there are physiotherapy recommendations that were put together um, by uh, or led by Glenn Nielsen, who's a physiotherapist in functional movement disorder. And as, as you're aware, um, F&D, um, there's not everybody knows how to work with patients with F&D. And first and foremost, not many people know what occupational therapists do. <laughs> so the idea of this paper is to try and uh, let patients, but also other members of the MDT, um, really know that occupational therapists have it integral role in treating patients with F&D and to outline what we as occupational therapists can offer to this patient group. But it's also designed to um, be a little bit of a framework for occupational therapists that are not familiar with working with patients with F&D. Um, so it's just to try and give, give them a leg up as to what they should be considering in their, their assessment and in their treatment programs for patients with F&D. Uh, you mentioned, you talked kind of about the role of OT in treatment. Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit more about that role? In yeah. It's um, occupational therapy. It, that is actually a tricky one, Bridget, because um, occupational therapy is very varied and it's we have a very wide and a wide scope of um, treatment practice. Um, but with occupational therapy and F&D, what we would try and do is identify what the impact of the patient's symptoms are on their ability to undertake their day-to-day -day activities. So our treatment and our scope of treatment is very much directed by the patient. And initially we would sit down and we would ask the patient, how are your symptoms impacting upon your ability to do things in a fashion that you want to be able to do them? So their performance and also their satisfaction with their performance. And that could be, and yeah, an occupation in um, occupational therapy doesn't just um, refer to paid employment, although it can do. Um, but we as occupational therapists see occupation as any activity that a patient would undertake within their day-to-day -day roles. So it could be personal care, it could be domestic activities, it could be leisure activities, it could be parenting roles, any, anything. Right. It depends well, on what the patient is having trouble with. Well, with FND, where it affects so many different areas of your life, I could see yeah. how that's really important, regardless, as you said, whether you're going back to work or just trying to learn how to function again within your home and contribute, you know, and, and raise your children still and, and things like that, that, that would be very important. Who should be uh, referred to an OT? Yeah, well... Any, any patient that is having, um, that has problems with their symptoms, that symptoms are impacting upon their ability to engage in their day-to-day -day occupations. Um, it, it could be, I mean, we see patients throughout a patient's journey from um, acute onset to people that have chronic symptoms as well. Um, and we see people that are actively rehabbing or, and we also see patients that might have tried rehab a few times, but haven't got very far. And then 
in that in that scope we might be more involved with disability management rather than rehabilitation so it's it can be across the course of a journey all yeah. right so would you yeah. do some kind of like assessment with the patient to see what their needs and things are um can you explain a little bit what that would entail and the types yeah. of you might be looking for if you haven't yeah. done them already no that's okay so uh, so in the first instance, we really would um, actually sit down one-to-one -one with the patient and talk about their symptoms. So getting an idea of the breadth of symptoms, because sometimes they are um, directly related to F and D, and other, other times there's secondary symptoms, um, such as fatigue and um, chronic pain, um, or other patients might have comorbidities that impact directly on their F and D symptoms as well. So we want to get a really good understanding of what the breadth of symptoms are that the patient is having to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we look at impact. So how are those symptoms impacting on their ability to get to engage in the whole scope of activities that they would normally be doing? Um, and once we've got a better idea of that, then we would do um, a practical assessment with the patient as well. So we would look at them within an activity um, so, for example, if someone might have um, functional upper limb tremor, we might have a look at, uh, if it's relevant to the patient, have it, having a look at what they're doing in the kitchen environment and seeing how their, their tremor might stop them from um, fully participating in meal preparation or being safe within the kitchen environment, just as an example. Do you have any like specific outcome measures or things that you're looking at to kind of assess the changes um, in FND through therapy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, most occupational therapists would use some form of outcome measure, or, or they should be. Um, but I think it, it depends on the setting in which you're working. Um, we certainly here at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery uh, as a matter of course, we use the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, and that's an OT-specific uh, specific measure um, that looks at a patient's performance, but also their satisfaction with their performance. So and, it's really important yeah. how they feel about their change in how they're doing as well. Exactly, that's yeah. Great. That's great. So we would use the COPM um, as, a, as an outcome measure, but also as a form of activity analysis. So what that means is really breaking down how the symptoms are impacting upon their ability to do their day-to-day -day activities. And then, of course, we use a whole gamut of other outcome measures as well um, that don't just look at physical symptoms, but look at um, how someone's mood might be impacting as well, how fatigue, how pain might be impacting as well. You so, can definitely see how those would correlate one or the other, you know, and they all need to be assessed and addressed and appropriately yeah. work towards it. Yeah, they do. That's yeah, fair. because it's not just about how, uh, you know, how one part of the body moves. It's how the whole, whole body, the brain and the body, interact together. So you need a gamut of um, outcome measures that assesses those changes and so that you can ch keep check of, check of changes during your rehab process. Can you provide us kind of an overview of the different uh, treatment principles and um, intervention treatments? Yeah, so I mean, it can be, it's very varied, um, but typically some of the, the more common things that we would do um, would be around um, really looking at fatigue management and pain management and looking at um, getting a balance of activities so so that symptoms are not constantly being flared or exacerbated. Um, we would look at reintegrating um, people back into activities that they might have avoided or um, so for example it's very common for our patients with non-epileptic seizures um, to have withdrawn a, a lot from accessing the community or Need, they might need supervision in everything that they do because of fear of having a non-epileptic seizure during an activity. Um, so we do we would use a graded goal setting approach to reintegrate people back into activities that might be feared or might be being avoided. Um, 
and we we look at um, the integration of normal movement strategies um, into day-to-day -day function if functional movement disorder is an issue. Now, um, you, you talked about the difference of like trying to do some OT for like calm and just uh, managing within their day-to-day -day routine. But then we also talked about like getting back to work and some of those type of things. Can you explain a little bit maybe how that may be different? How like a vocational rehab? Yeah. Yeah. So when we when we as OTs um, talk about vocational rehab, uh, we would look be looking at helping to maintain a person within their paid working roles. But also, um, it can encompass um, voluntary roles, and it can encompass studying and reintegrating um, young people into school or into university that might have um, F and D. Um, and what we would primarily be doing is trying to look at the impact of their symptoms on their engagement with their working roles, um, how the symptoms might be stopping them from achieving um, the best that they can within their their paid workplace or within the student roles or within their voluntary roles. Um, and some of that is about looking at symptom management within the workplace. And some of it's about educating um, um, employers and educating fellow work colleagues is how to best help that particular person manage their symptoms within the work. It could be role or it could be helping to get people back into work after a period of sick leave or it could be helping the people look look for work as well and or look for voluntary work as a form of work hardening um, yes. uh, yeah mean, so it's quite varied the whole goal yeah. is to get people back into their lives at whatever yep. level they're able to participate so I think the work that you're doing is really vital to our, the FND community and I could see how it would uh, paper like what you're writing would be very important in order to get some kind of funding for research and other areas actually um, as well so I really commend you for the work that you're doing uh, is there any other yeah. elements or things that we didn't have a chance to talk about that you'd like to share with us? Anything I missed? Well, or? I think. Well, I think probably we didn't discuss um, management of mood and looking at the whenever anybody has has a chronic health condition, not just F and D, mood has to come into into play, and the way that we think and feel um, impacts upon all of our bodily symptoms. So. As occupational therapists, we would also look at the impact of, of mood on and anxiety on symptoms, because often low mood and anxiety can exacerbate symptoms as they can for any other health condition. Okay. Um, so we as OTs quite often look at anxiety management and relaxation, um, integrating people back into leisure activities that they may be either avoiding or may have put to the side. Um, since the onset of their symptoms just to help improve quality of life. Because um, lots of, many times when people are really ill, mm -hmm. um, they prioritise the have-tos rather than the want-tos because that's all they've got energy for. Yeah. But actually when you're looking at F&D and quality of life, um, the want-to the want activities are just as important. And um, we would view that as an integral part of anybody's rehab. That's great because they really all do correlate. I mean, if you're only doing the, what you have to do all the time and you're never getting that enjoyment, it most definitely is going to start to wear on your emotional state, which is then going to impact your symptoms. So it, it's great to see that looking at that in a full circle of, and really who people are and their needs. And that's, yeah. that's fabulous. That's really important. Yeah. I think you find that in our community a lot, people trying to find new hobbies and you know, even new ways to go to work or to work around mm -hmm. some of those things because I think F and D people tend to be very high functioning uh, yes. people in their old world, right? And all of a sudden, they, everything's kind of cut from them. And, and so I think that being active is very important. Um, and yeah. Again, is really important. Yeah. 
And occupational therapists have a lot more to offer than just aids and adaptations. So <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, we yeah. really, again, we thank you for the work that you're doing. And um, when will this, will the paper be out? What's the next step? Yeah, so, uh, well, we've just uh, looked at the first draft. The whole group has looked at the first draft and um, I'm just collating all the comments from that now. Um, and realistically, we're hoping to have it ready for submission for publication or consideration of publication um, to, uh, towards sometime later this year. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, we yeah. really appreciate your time. We really appreciate uh, your willingness to involve the advocacy community and towards your work. And thank you again. And